Good to see everybody out tonight. Y'all have a good day. Beautiful day in the house of the Lord. I mean, beautiful day in Southern Illinois, but it's a great day in the house of the Lord, too. And so it's good to see everybody out tonight. Welcome everybody on Facebook. We are going to take prayer requests before we get started tonight. And we will jump right back in to the book of Revelation. So let's start off with prayer requests, okay? Um, I put Craig Baumgart on there. Um, he found out that he has several blockages and he's going to have to have open heart surgery, a quadruple bypass. And so we want to remember him in our prayers. Susan Hunter, I just talked to her. I need to remember her in our prayers. She's just recovering from a hip surgery. Tom Galdoni, how's your dad doing today, Amy? Okay, remember him in our prayers. Who else do we have? Aaron Ghost. Aaron Ghost had rotator cuff surgery today. I'm glad you said that, yep. Yeah. Who you got there? Bonnie Gilbert. Bonnie Gilbert. Robin? Rhonda Briscoe. Rhonda Carolyn Owens in our prayer. Not Carolyn Shell. No. Don't make that mistake again. Yeah. Remember Jeff Kreitz lost his father. Darlene. Remember Eric and Sarah. Rayanne. Praise God. Brother Bob. Willard Weiss liver cancer. Okay. Mr. Kohler. Family name? Uh, Kelly. Kelly family. Sarah Kelly. I didn't know the lady's name, but you know, the ghost grandpa whose husband just got diagnosed with leukemia. Doogie Fox. I'm talking to her yesterday, my mom. I'm taking three yards, but he's just freaked out. He's been one week out of the cancer. Yeah, he's had a tough battle, yeah. Remember, Brother Victor, unspokens. All right. I want to remember the lost and unsaved. All right. Remember Mel. All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And then, um, huh? Oh, Hawk. <laughs> I thought I heard something. I was like, what? Right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And then uh, we'll get into the Word. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, God, that we can gather together tonight. We thank you, Lord, that you are a God who hears and answers our prayers. And God, tonight, Lord, we lift up these names to you. You know every single situation and every single circumstance. We pray for those who are battling illness, who have recently found out of uh, struggles and trials and sickness. And we just pray, dear God, Lord, that you would guide them. We ultimately pray for their healing. We pray, dear God, Lord, whether it be through your divine touch, or rather through doctors and medicine, we just pray, God, you'd help them through their situation. We pray, dear God, for upcoming surgeries. Pray, God, for Craig tonight, God. You just guide the doctors and nurses, give them wisdom and knowledge as they, as they work on him. We pray, dear God, Lord, for all those who are recovering. 
from surgeries. We pray, dear God, the recovery might be easy. I pray, dear God, for those who are battling cancer tonight. We pray a special touch upon them. Pray for those who are still battling COVID. We pray, dear God, Lord, you touch them and be with them in a very special way. I pray, dear God, for all those who have recently lost loved ones. We pray, God, that you'd help them as they fight grief and, and Lord, struggle. And we just pray, God, your leadership and direction over them. Lord, we thank you, God, for the work that you're doing in us amongst us. And, Lord, we continue to ask to see people saved. I pray, God, that you'd bring people to a knowing relationship in you. And I pray, God, you would continue to advance your kingdom. And we thank you, God, for the work that you're doing. Help us to be part of it. I pray for those unspoken requests that are on our heart tonight, uh, Lord, that only uh, you know. And we just pray, dear God, you touch them situations and you touch those circumstances. Lord, we're thankful that we could gather here tonight. We pray, Lord, you'd be with us as we look into your word. We are thankful, God, for the blessing of revelation. Thank you, God, for giving it to us. And I just pray, God, you'd impart wisdom through your spirit in our midst tonight. In Jesus' name, and we all said, Amen. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, turn to the end. Hopefully you enjoyed last week. Amen. Amen. And so um, we went over the rapture last week, if you're new and just joining us. And we talked about essentially four views of the rapture. The first one being that we would be raptured before anything began. Um, Yeah, you're supposed to be like, yes, that's what we want, right? Praise God. Um, The other one is in the middle of the tribulation. Um, We talked about towards the end of the tribulation. And then we ultimately talked um, about the second coming of Christ would be the fulfillment of the rapture. And so tonight we are going to talk about Revelation chapter 6. And so as we get into Revelation chapter 6, before we jump in there, I just want to talk about what happens in the previous five chapters. Because when we talk about the tribulation, we draw that from Thessalonians. We draw it from Matthew 24. We did look at some scripture last week in the book of Revelation. But really, in Revelation chapter 1, we're kind of introduced to the, whole, uh, to, the, to the whole book. We meet John, we meet Jesus, it describes who Jesus is, what he's about. Um, and then in chapters 2 and 3, it takes us through the seven churches of Asia. And it talks about each of their situations at the current time. Um, one church that we always know of, that's lukewarm. You ever heard about the lukewarm church? Um, we, we, uh, there's all types. Um, Ephesus left its first love. Um, so I encourage you, don't skip over those. It's a very, very important part, but I, I want to try to just jump to the events. In Revelation chapter 4 and 5, we're taken up to heaven, and John gets his first glimpse of the throne room. And when we're taken up there, it's the same throne room that always was. And so if you look in Isaiah, you're looking at the same thr- throne room. And so we see God on the throne, and we see these elders that are encamped about him. And they have this scroll, this book that needs to be opened up. Now this book is containing the seals that we're going to read about here tonight in Revelation chapter 6. But nobody is worthy to open the book. They can't find anybody. And finally, there's this lamb that had been slain who was worthy to open the book. And the Bible says they sang a new song. And he rose up from among them and he took the book out of their hands. Now, that's referring to Jesus Christ. And so we know that Jesus Christ is the only one who is worthy. And so in Revelation chapter 5, he begins, he's holding that book. And... He's the one that opens these seals, all right? So this isn't Satan opening these seals. This is God, Jesus Christ, opening up these seals. This is him bringing this wrath upon this world who has rejected him, who has pushed him away, who has not acknowledged him, who has not given over. And so when we understand, when we're reading these seals, you think, man, when we get into this, listen, they don't make this stuff up in the movies, You understand me? We're talking about some wow stuff. I I went back to last year and um, about this time there was a mad rush for toilet paper. Do y'all remember this? Y'all probably still got toilet paper from last year, don't you? Um, And so, listen, we thought, man, what are we going to do without toilet paper? The mad rushes, the pure chaos of Revelation. This is, last year was amateur hour. Complete amateur hour. And so when we go into this, I'm taking everything in here very literal. I I, I tend to take scripture literally. And so, um, listen, like I said last week, uh, if you weren't here, this is my class. (laughs) All right. So I know there's differing opinions and I respect them all. But if you have a question, hopefully at the end we'll have a little bit of discussion time. But if you have a question specifically, 
come up to me afterwards and I'll, I'll give you all the time you want, okay? Um, but I probably won't be like taking questions in the middle of it. Does that make sense? And so, the seven seals of Revelation. So, the tribulation is going to be how long? Seven years, all right? So, a lot of times we see this advertisement or you might have heard people talk about three and a half years of peace, all right? So, if it's three and a half years of peace, then why is it called a seven-year tribulation? You see what I'm saying? So, seven years of tribulation tends to believe that there's going to be how many years of tribulation? Seven. Now, it's going to start off with peace. Peace made with who? Peace made with Israel, all right? There's going to be a peace treaty made with Israel. Keep your eyes on Israel, all right? Israel's important, all right? Um, all throughout God's Word, He says that people should honor Israel. Um, that's why it's important for America to honor Israel. Um, Israel's God's chosen nation, so we, we have to see that. Um, so, Revelation chapter 6, we're going to go through this very slowly tonight. He's going to open up the first seal. The first seal is, let's read it, it comes in verse 2. It says, I looked up and I saw a white horse standing there. Its rider carried a bow and a crown was placed on his head. He rode out to win many battles and gain the victory. So the very first seal that Christ opens up in Revela from grabbing the book in Revelation 5 is this white horse. Now, this white horse is the Antichrist, all right? Later on in a couple of weeks, we're actually going to have a whole lesson devoted to the Antichrist. But tonight we're just going to touch it, okay? So the Antichrist, there's a few things you need to know about the Antichrist. Number one, he's an imitator of Christ. He wants to be Christ. In Revelation chapter 19, Jesus himself is going to come back on guess what color of a horse? White horse. Guess what this guy's coming in on? A white horse. Why? Because he wants to be an imitator of who? Of Christ. Um, he, he does his best to imitate. When this man comes, he will be of greatest disguise. He will fool many people. He will fool people who sit in rooms just like this one. He will be the master of disguise. He'll disguise himself as an angel of light. Um, he is not Christ. Amen? Now, let me just tell you just a few things about Christ. Um, Christ is omnipresent, okay? Which means he's everywhere at every moment, all right? So if we leave here and we were to fly across the earth in about two seconds, guess who's over there? Christ. Um, Tonight, I believe that the Holy Spirit, He's in me, all right? When I go home, I'm not taking Him with me. You're taking Him. I'm not taking Him with me, but you're taking Him too. Why? Because He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. Satan is not going. Antichrist is not everywhere. He doesn't have that ability. He's not omnipotent. God is all-powerful, all right? He can do anything He wants to do. Why? Because He's God. Satan is not. He is not Christ. While He will imitate Christ, what is He not? He's not Christ, okay? Next thing. He's inspired by Satan. He's inspired by Satan. He's Satan's puppet. Got him on a string, all right? You do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. Who's he inspired by? Satan. Satan. Last, he's going to be disguised as the tribulation goes on. His disguise will start to come over and over. He'll be partially disguised is the way I like to describe it. Because if he was disguised completely, you may not be able to tell the difference. But I think if you're a true child of God and you truly know the word of God, you'll be able to recognize the counterfeit. Amen? And so, when this first seal is opened up, when this tribulation begins, the idea is that there is going to be um, this treaty that takes place. Now, it's interesting because the treaty with Israel has to come from somewhere. So, it would make sense... That there would be some type of major war that would take place, okay? Um, because in order to have peace, you got to have what before? War. Now I will tell you, if you go to the Middle East right now, it's still it's not a very peaceful place. All right, there's a lot of fights. I know that recently during the Trump administration, there were some peace treaties made. Not really the one we're ultimately looking for, but ultimately um, you're going to see some type of probably more than likely would chaos that would take place. 
And ultimately following that would be a treaty that would take place. That treaty would mark the beginning of this tribulation. Shortly after that, probably in the middle of that, a very important part of that process will be this Antichrist who will help negotiate this peace. He will be a worldwide figure, all right? Not just an American figure, an Israel figure. He will be worldwide, all right? Everybody will know him. Now, is it very easy to recognize somebody from around the world right now? Sure. We got these things in our hands and in our pockets right now. We can find out what's going on. We can watch cameras overseas. You can watch news reports. It's going to be very easy to recognize them. He's going to be set on the world stage. And he's going to be an integral part of that. Now, these six seals, all right, and I'll get this. I'll put this in a timeline at the end um, of tonight's lesson. But these first four specifically, I think they're kind of happening simultaneously. Does that make sense? Um, not just one seal and then the second seal and the third seal. I feel like the Lord Jesus is kind of ripping all, all the first four off all at one time. And the fifth very shortly thereafter, okay? And so um, let, let's just put this all together. The next one is the red horse. All right? The red horse. So the first seal is the white horse. It's the rise of the Antichrist. The second horse is the red horse. We find it in Revelation chapter 6, verse 4. It says, Then another horse appeared, a red one. Its rider was given a mighty sword and the authority to take peace from the earth. Emphasis, take peace from the earth, meaning that there had to start with what? Peace. From the earth. And there was war and slaughter everywhere. Not just in one location, but where? Everywhere. Everywhere. Now, so you have the rise of the Antichrist, all right? He hits the world scene. Shortly thereafterwards, there's going to be something built. Once this peace treaty takes place, there's going to be something built in Jerusalem known as the temple, okay? I, I shared this a little bit. Now, it's going to take some time to build this temple, but... I want you to know they can build things fairly quickly. There are some people that actually think that there are portions of the temple being built around the world, kind of like a manufactured home. They're just going to bring it together and put it together. Um, but if you want things built, trust me, you can get them built. Um, I was working with Todd Barnett putting lights up here. I was his gopher, and we were talking about this, and he was telling me that it took him a year, just a year, to build the Empire State Building in the early 1900s. And you think about the way we can build things now. It, this temple can get up very quickly. And so somewhere in the first three to six months of this beginning of this tribulation, it looks like there will be a t temple that is erected in the place where the Dome of the Rock currently is in Jerusalem, which means a lot of things got to happen. That's probably got to be destroyed, emphasizing that there was a war, all right, that took place and peace was made. This temple's brought on. Somewhere as soon as this temple's built, two witnesses show up, all right? We're going to have a whole lesson dedicated to these two witnesses as well. And they're going to start preaching out there for 1,260 days or three and a half years, okay? We'll come back to that. The Antichrist has risen up. There begins to be peace seemingly around the world. And then what breaks out? War. Now, when I was 11 years old, it was the first war I ever seen. It was the first Iraq war. Um, 1991, 92, 93, that vicinity. Um, I can remember, um, and I don't know what it was like in the Vietnam War. Kohler, you can tell us about the Civil War and stuff like that. Um, but in 19, I, can remember, I, I can remember where I was sitting at when, when, when George H.W. Bush announced that we were going to war. I can remember watching the news reports and seeing the, 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 the fighting take place. It was very vivid. Um, I was very afraid. It really didn't have anything to do with us specifically in our country at this time. But this war is going to be worldwide. In America, we really haven't had wars here per se, especially in our lifetime. Um, Kohler, you're the one. Um, anyway, I'm just kidding, by the way. Um, I, I miss you. It's good to have you back. You know? and, um, but we haven't seen war. All right, we don't know what war is. We don't know what it is to, to, to uh, you know, run and, and have bombs coming down and missiles coming down and hearing those sirens. Um, I know during the Cold War, um, they used to have bomb, bomb, bomb drills. Y'all, how many of you remember bomb drills? That was before my time as well. And 
You know, there was that, there was that threat during the, day of, uh, the, the Bay of Pigs deal and in in, in, in back in the, in, the, in the 60s. But nonetheless, America, we haven't seen war. But this war is to be worldwide, all right? It's going to affect everybody. What, what kind of war affects everybody now? What? Nuclear. Nuclear. Let's check this out. Battle of Gog and Magog. I tell you what, I put that on there a couple days ago. I'm just going to scratch through that right now, okay? Nuclear. Nuclear. Now, what do nuclear wars do? They cause worldwide destruction, don't they? All right? The next big war we have isn't with machine guns. It's with nuclear missiles. Now, the last time that we seen a nuclear bomb dropped was when? World War, World War II, right? It was so bad that they decided, listen, we don't want to use this. Reagan and Gorbachev in the 1980s came up with something called a mutual deterrent. So a mutual destruction. And so if we press the button, it gives them time to press the button and everybody's going to be destroyed. Does that make sense? There are several major uh, nuclear powers in the world, but let's just kind of narrow them down to, I don't know, three. All right? Who are those three? United States, Russia, China. China. United States itself has enough nuclear missiles to destroy the entire world. Russia has enough nuclear missiles itself to destroy the entire world. China itself has enough nuclear missiles to destroy the entire world. Now, when you say, well, war, listen, we're not talking about the battle of Iraq here. We're talking about war. This rider is going to unleash war. I'm talking war. Like we've never even dreamed of or we've never had the concept of. The worldwide fear that is going to be cast out will be amazing. Notice the rise of the Antichrist and war, the, the war being unleashed all at the same time. All right? Number three, World War Three, worldwide destruction. It hits everywhere. The third seal, the black horse, famine. When the land broke the third seal, I heard the third living being saying, Come. I looked up and I saw a black horse and its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice from among the four living beings saying, A loaf of wheat bread or, th or three loaves of barley will cost a day's pay and don't waste the olive oil and wine. All right? So unleashing here in these first three seals, we see the coming of the Antichrist, the rise of the Antichrist. We see some type of worldwide war, all right? Thirdly, we see famine. Now, we've never had nuclear winter. But if you lift off nuclear missiles all over the place, what's going to proceed after that? Somebody say it? Famine, right, because what's going to happen? None's going to grow, is it? All right? And so... Obviously, that's speculation from your pastor, but it makes good sense in the way that we live today. What else can famine come from? God. <laughs> Who's breaking these seals? God. Can God control the, the, the rain? Yep, he sure can. And so when we start putting things together and you start seeing these seals being opened, specifically these first four, you see the rise of the Antichrist. You see war being unleashed. You see famine. Things start to fit. Does that make sense? And if, things can, if you have a massive nuclear war, if you have massive nuclear winter, then you have great famine. Now, from this famine, we see something even that, 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 that looks even closer. We see the nuclear winter, worldwide famine. Not just a famine in a certain, for a certain place. So... Um, you take, if you were to go back to the, the, one of the most popular famines that we know of, where do we find it at? Depression. Eh, depression, not, yeah, but let's go back further. Bible, but where at in the Bible? Huh? Egypt, right? Do you remember the, remember the famine in Egypt? 
and, and, and they stored up for it, right? They stored up for it. And so um, there was prep for it. And, and so they were able to survive it. There, people came looking for it. What does it lead to? Major inflation. <laughs> now, you guys think gas prices are high today? Let's just, I want to, let me get back there. Look, look at this. A loaf of wheat bread or three loaves of barley will cost the day's pay. How much does a loaf of bread cost today? 79 cents, something like that. Dollar, Steph? I don't go grocery shopping, so don't hold this against me. Is that lower? Is it? I think we could get bread for 79 cents. I will, get, I will dig into this, okay? But nonetheless, we're talking about major inflation. Now, listen, think about, think about inflation. I'm being serious. I want us to just think about this for a second. Some of you, some of you, this past week or two, you got a stimulus check. Others of us are still waiting on it, may come, may not. But the more money that is pushed into our economy, there's nothing, there's literally nothing to back it up. It's completely paper. The more money you print, the higher things cost. Does that make sense? That's called inflation. You're inflating the numbers. Does that make sense? McBride, Roland McBride here, he said the greatest, he's told me this four or five times, he's like, the greatest mistake we ever made, Roland, was what? Going off the gold standard. He's like, that's where you can chalk it up to, Andy. We have literally nothing to back up the, the money that's being printed. It is not worth the paper that it's printed on, all right? Now, for right now it is, but it's built literally on a house of cards, okay? It's literally built on a house of cards. So when this time comes, your money, worthless. All that paper money that we have placed in the stock market, worthless. People will literally be starving. They'll be starving. Not just people in Africa, people here will be starving. How do you know that, Pastor Andy? Because the fourth seal is this. The fourth seal... Is death. Now it's a result of the previous three seals. It's a result of the previous three seals. This one comes in a pale green horse. It says, When the Lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the fourth living being say, Come. And I looked up and I saw a horse whose color was pale. Its rider was named Death, and his companion was the grave. These two were given authority over one-fourth of the earth to kill with sword, famine, and disease, and wild animals. There are seven billion people in the world. It's about 1.5 billion people that are going to die. That's a lot. We thought coronavirus killed a lot, dropping a hat. We don't even understand what a billion means. Put it like this, if I was to tell the church and say, church, I'm going to take a vacation for a million seconds. You know how long I'd be gone? I'd be gone about 11 days. If I was to take a vacation for a billion seconds, you know how long I'd be gone? About 11 years. It's a lot of people. Do you remember when the coronavirus started in New York and they were brought trailers in for bodies? Do you remember that? What do you do with 1.5 billion bodies? Can you imagine the stench? Can you imagine the smell? In the first four seals, we see judgment upon this earth like we have never seen. We see the rise of a one world leader. In the midst of it, he's trying to make peace everywhere. This war is taking place. These two witnesses are preaching. Because of these wars, famine has broken out. Death, that fourth seal comes and it conquers. Let's just focus on this death for a second. It's a consequence of these first three seals. It's the result of it. War, famine... The rule of the Antichrist. Over and over and over and over and over again we see this. 
There's death everywhere. 1.4, excuse me, 1.5 billion. Wow. Now, let's stop for just a second. Take a deep breath. Because that's a lot to inhale, right? Now listen, I got good news, all right? And I got bad news. Which do you want first? Okay, I'll just give you the good news first. God is still on the throne through all this. Amen? Now, the bad news is this. The more I study this out, man, I don't know, church. I'm still rooting for that first, that first, tribute, that first rapture theory. But I'm going to tell you, this second one, boy, the fifth seal is martyrdom and persecution. It's not martyrdom and persecution of unbelievers. It's martyrdom and persecution of believers. Now, these believers got to come from somewhere. Where are believers at right now? They're here. Amen. How many of you are a believer tonight, right? And so the fifth seal that is opened up is martyrdom and persecution. It says, when the Lamb broke the fifth seal... I saw under the altar the souls of all who had been martyred for the word of God and for being faithful in their testimony. Amen? There's going to be a mass persecution of people who believe in Jesus Christ. It'll separate the wheat from the tares. It says, they shouted to the Lord and said, O oh, sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge the people who belong to this world and avenge our blood for what they have done to us? Now, it says that they're under the altar. Now, in Leviticus, when they would have a sacrifice upon the altar, the blood would puddle up where? Under the altar. Their blood, the sac they're sacrificing their lives for who? For Jesus, they believe in Jesus Christ and their blood is being shed. Why? Because they refuse to deny him. In no circumstance will they deny him. Now, I just want to, I, I don't, I want to say, worldwide persecution of the saints of God. Now, in the, er, in the early church age, almost every disciple was persecuted, was martyred on the behalf of Christ. Stephen, the most famous, the first martyr, he was stoned in Acts chapter 7. Literally rocks were thrown at him and he was pelted with rocks until he died. Throughout, throughout history, we have seen Christians being martyred. In fact, there is great persecution of the church today. Maybe not here, but when you go other places, people hate Jesus Christ and they hate his people. It's a true hatred. But believe it or not, persecution will come here. Your life will literally be held in the balance. Do you believe in Christ or not? Think of it. We could get, you could even go further. They could hold up my son Jack and say, Andy, do you really believe in Christ now? Under no circumstance at all should we ever deny our faith in Christ. Now, people from the outside will say, man, that sounds cultish, man. Listen, eye hath not heard, I hath not seen, and ear hath not heard what God had stored up for his children in heaven. There's nothing that compares to what God has for us. Romans 8 said, he said, I reckon, Paul said, I reckon the current sufferings do not even hold their weight compared to what God has for us in glory. Understand I don't even want to speculate further about what the persecution will be. But there is mass persecution of those who believe in Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter 7, the chapter after this, John's in the spirit. He's brought into heaven. And the angel who's with him says these words to him. He says, um, John, who are those people who are gathered around the throne? The Bible says there was a mass number that he couldn't even count. Now, they weren't there. In Revelation chapter 4 and 5. But in Revelation 7, guess what? They're there. Sounds rapturous and persecution to me, okay? 
This is what he says. He says, who are they? And John says, I don't know who they are. You should be telling me that. And he says, these are they who have come out of great tribulation, who have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. And they are forever getting their rest. Forever getting their rest. Mass persecution will be unleashed upon the church of Jesus Christ. Now, we started this with the first seal, the rise of whom? The Antichrist. Then we see war take place. We see uh, famine take place. We see death take place. Now we see this mass persecution take place. Um, we see the rise of the Antichrist. Around this time of mass persecution, we have to place something there, which would probably be that Satan's or uh, Antichrist empire is being set up on earth. So we might see things like the mark of the beast, which we'll have a whole lesson for. Um, the, him desecrating the temple, which we'll have a whole lesson for, or it'll be part of that lesson. Nonetheless, somewhere around this time, we're going to see a hatred of Christianity and we're going to see a recognition of a worldwide religion that comes about halfway to what we may know or want, okay, or the, to what's true. Does that make sense? It'll try to resemble what we know, but it won't be what we know. But many people will buy into it. It'll love everybody, all right? It'll be all-inclusive. There won't be no wrong to it, okay? Everybody will be fine. You can do pretty much anything you want as long as you admire one guy, right? As long as you pattern yourself and follow along, do what you're told to do, you'll be okay. But there will be a defining difference. After this fifth seal is broken, number six hits. Now, number six, Katie bar the door, all right? You think it's getting serious now? We haven't even put a drop in the bucket yet, okay? Like the bad stuff isn't even here yet. This is like lightweight compared to what's going to happen, okay? Number seven. There's number six. A catastrophic natural event. Look what the word says. It says, I watched as the lamb broke the sixth seal. And there was a great earthquake. The sun became as dark as black cloth. And the moon became as red as blood. Then the stars of the sky fell to the earth like green figs falling from a tree shaken by a strong wind. The sky was rolled up like a scroll and all the mountains and islands were moved from their places. Go to Hawaii now. A catastrophic earthquake. That doesn't just shake Japan. It doesn't just shake California. What does it shake? The earth. It shakes the earth. The moon turns red. Wow. Amen. The sun turns. Well, we didn't think that one out. Where are you at on that one, Steph? Huh? The sun turns black. Sounds ecliptical, doesn't it? When's the next eclipse? 2024. Mountains disappear. They vanish. Mountains vanish. Wow. And it produces mass terror. I, I want to just read uh, the scripture that I don't have up here tonight in Revelation 6. Verse 15 of Revelation chapter 6. Then everyone, the kings of the earth, the rulers, the generals, the wealthy, the powerful, and every slave and free person all hid themselves in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they cried to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of the wrath has come, and who is able to survive? How many people? Everyone. Mass terror is over the earth. You think about, they ain't running for toilet paper. They're running for the, 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 the caves. 
May rocks cover us so it'll hide us from the terror of God. They recognize who's bringing this on them. And yet, they still don't repent. They still don't repent. Let's try to kind of place this in our last few minutes here in a timeline if we can. Um, oh, hopefully you can see this good. So, so tribulations, how long? Seven years. So let's break this up into three and a half year segments, okay? So, now hopefully this is us, but I don't know, okay? The guy I stole this off thought it was here, okay? And so, praise God if we go up right there, amen? That's what we want, okay? But let's just take these first six seals somewhere in this first three and a half years, all right? So, with that being said, they kind of unleash all at one time, just just, 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 just band-aid that all takes place. And so, while the Antichrist is coming up on his conquest to conquer, warfare starts to show up. Open warfare starts to happen. Next thing you know, there's world famine. Next thing you know, there's death. One quarter of mankind dies. Next thing you know, there's mass persecution of the saints of God. Next thing you know, there's this major earthquake that takes place. I kind of think about it. Do you remember in the book of Job? In Job chapter 1, when one messenger came, and then as soon as he got done talking, another messenger came, and then another messenger came, then another messenger came. I think of it in that, in that concept. These are rolling together, almost overlapping, most sometimes interceding one another. Uh, one event is causing another event. And so a lot of times you think of them as one at a time. All right, we're ready for the next one. It won't be like that. It'll all be together, almost synchronized. Why? Because God is unleashing his terror on everybody. Now listen. When I said this a while ago, this is amateur hour to what's getting ready to happen. I mean, if you go in my office right now, my whiteboard is completely covered with 21 judgments of God. Because there's not just seven, there's 21. And the seventh seal, which we're going to talk about here before we get done, it calls in this, this, this trumpet judgment. During the trumpet judgments, we call it the judgment of the one-thirds. One-third of everything is going to be wiped out. So one-third of vegetation, one-third of the sun, one-third of the stars, one-third of the ocean, one-third of fresh water, one-third of mankind, one-third of the animals, one-third of the birds, one-third of the sea, one-third of everything gone. There's going to be locusts that are going to attack people. All right? We ain't seen nothing yet. I just want to show you, this is the first three and a half years first three and a half years all hell is literally broke loose on earth and there's nothing that no world superpower can do about it not a soul can hide from it you can't buy your way out of it because money is worthless when we begin to sit back and look at this there's a few things that I think we've got to kind of take away from it the first thing is and I shared this last week it's so important to know God I mean, because we really believe this was going to happen. This is going to happen. We believe that the time is near. The time is right. In fact, flip your Bibles over, if you will, in Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is asked about these days, all right? And there's all types of different opinions, and I'm just going to kind of just steer us through this. Look at verse 4. It says in, in Matthew chapter 24, it says, Jesus told them, don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many, and you will hear of wars and threats of wars. But don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against what? Nation. Sound familiar? Seal number 2. And kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines. Sound familiar? Seal number three. And earthquakes in many parts of the world. But this is only first of the birth pains with more to come. You see why we push it towards the first three and a half years? This is just the birth pains. Um, 
For all of you women who've had children, before you give birth, you have contractions that let you know that it's, hey, it's time to go to the hospital. Pains start happening. They get closer and closer and closer together. As the tribulation marches on, it gets closer and closer and closer together, and the pain gets more and more and more intense. Skip on down. So if someone, verse 26, let's start 23. It says, then if anyone tells you, look. Actually, you know what? Go back to 15. <laughs> I'm sorry. It says, the day of the Lord is coming when you will see what Daniel the prophet spoke about. The sacrilegious object that causes desecration standing in the holy place. My Bible says, reader, pay attention. Then those in Judea must flee to the hills. A person out on the deck of the roof must not go down to the house to pack. A person out in the field must not return even to get a coat. How terrible it will be for pregnant women and for nursing mothers in those days. And pray that your flight will not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For there will be greater anguish than at any time since the world began. And it will never be so great again. In fact, unless that time of calamity is shortened, not a single person will survive. But... It will be shortened for the sake of God's. Then if anyone tells you, look, here's the Messiah, there he is, don't believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will rise up and perform great signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, even God's chosen ones. See, I have warned you about this ahead of the time. Verse 26, so if anyone tells you, look, the Messiah is out in the desert... Don't bother to go and look, or look, he is hiding. Don't believe it. For as the lightning flashes in the east and shines to the west, so it will be when the Son of Man comes. Just as the gathering of vultures shows there is a carcass nearby, so these signs indicate that the end is near. Immediately after the anguish of those days, the sun will be darkened. The moon will give no light. The stars will fall from the sky. The powers in the heaven will be shaken. That just describes... Revelation chapter 9, when we talk about the bold judgments. Excuse me. Revelation 13, 14, 15. I don't have my notes. It literally describes it in Matthew, what's taking place. Friends, crazy stuff. So, these first six seals, it's my belief. Now, could Andy be wrong? Yes. Because I don't think anybody has the dogmatic ability, an opinion to be able to stand up here and say, hey, this is exactly what's going to happen. Okay, I'm just trying to give you highlights. This is what the Word of God says, and this makes sense. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, about the three and a half year mark, all right, there's going to be a trumpet that's going to blow, or the seventh seal is going to be opened, okay? Now, we just read verse 15. Okay, of chapter 6. That's the last verse in chapter 6. Now, this one isn't going to be like the other ones. This is going to lead us to a whole nother series of judgments called the trumpets. Then when we get to the seventh trumpet, there's going to be a whole nother series of judgments released called the bowl judgments. All right? And so let's just read the seventh seal. It says, when the lamb broke the seventh seal, this is Revelation 8, verse 1. It says, when the Lamb broke the seventh seal on the scroll, there was a silence throughout heaven for about half an hour. Now, remind yourself about time there. A thousand days on earth is as to one day in heaven. So, it could be 30 minutes, it could be an hour. I don't think, it's obviously no longer than seven years, right? Um, there was silence throughout the earth for about a half an hour, and I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and they were given seven trumpets. Now, next week we're going to talk about this middle period of the tribulation, this half an hour, if you will. And then the next week we'll talk about the seven trumpets, then we'll talk about the seven bowls, then we'll talk about the Antichrist and the uh, Mark of the Beast together. And then finally, the last week, we'll talk about when it gets really good. <laughs> Revelation 19 through 21, when Jesus comes back. And um, there we go. All right. Revelation 2, second lesson wrapped up. Um, we got about 10 minutes. Does anybody have questions or comments? or? Yeah. Yes, Roger. Can you go back to seal 4? Seal 4. Can you take us back to seal 4? To the right. Let me see. Uh, 
Ah, I messed it up. Next week is the Pinewood Derby. Yes. We will not be talking Revelation. We're going to be talking racing next week. Okay? Yeah, let's not talk about that. Right. I'm glad you said that. Next week, listen, I expect to see you all back out again. 6 o'clock, not 6.30. We have hot dogs, chili dogs, sodas, and we're going to have a race. All right? So please come be part of that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, I mean, I feel like if I was just basing my own personal opinion, I, if there, I feel like the first three and a half years were probably here. I'm hoping we're wrong. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm game if God takes us early. But what's the dangers in thinking you're going to be taken early? You'd be taken by surprise. You, you'd be taken by surprise. Listen. You, if, 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 there's nothing wrong with one. But yeah, be prepared. That's the key word. We want to be on the lookout for these things. You know what I mean? You want to recognize um, it's good to, obviously, I don't think we should, we should obviously believe in God, but it's, it's not a dumb idea to be prepared for things. You understand me? I mean, to recognize things, to talk to your family about things. You know what I mean? If we really believe the Bible, we believe these are true events that will take place. Of things will go crazy because there won't be any supply and demand, right? And your money will be worthless. And when the money becomes worthless, what do you see? You see, you see an opportunity for a worldwide financial system. Does that make sense? So, um, obviously, you're going back to the concept of, I mean, and I take solace. Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so, if you become physically deceased on this earth, your body may be here, but your soul and spirit go to be with the Lord. And so, there's peace in the presence of the Lord. Um, That's what I know. Anything else I can't speculate on. You know, people have asked, do people in heaven still know what's going on here? Well, I don't know. You know what I mean? I, I ain't there. Um, but my point is, is that you, you, I don't think that you're experiencing pain afterwards if, if you, I mean, if you pass away, no. After, after the seals, is that what you're saying? Right. Well, what, what we haven't brought up yet is that the, in Revelation chapter 7, when there's a gap, so the first six seals are delivered in Revelation chapter 6, and then chapter 7 kind of takes an intermission, and it introduces us to 144,000 witnesses. That'll be from the 12 tribes of Jerusalem. They'll actually be Jews who believe in Christ. 
And their job will be to evangelize the world. So we'll still see people being saved throughout the tribulation. Now there'll be less and less because we get to, when we get to the latter judgment, it says nobody repents. Um, and ultimately all these Jews will be um, persecuted as well. Um, there'll be mass persecution of them. And we'll see them obviously win people to the Lord. So there's still believers here that, that would be persecuted during that time. Yes, sir. Maybe. Hopefully. Pre- hopefully. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> well, again, people will be being saved during that time. So let's just say, let, let's just use this for an, ex- for an example. Say the night the rapture happens here in the next five minutes. All right, so say, I don't know, 30% of you are left behind. And we just got done talking about this. What do you think those 30% are going to do? <laughs> then 30% would, ought to be hitting that altar quick, amen? <laughs> they could be, that could very well be. If we're, if, we're, if we're raptured before this begins, that would be the answer, yes. His grace is still good. Yeah. So even after the rapture, you believe you think that people can still be saved? Yeah, that, that's what the Jew, the 144,000 Jews, that's their job. Yeah. I mean, their job is to evangelize. Now, how many ever people come? I think the further the seals go when we get into the trumpet judgments and the bowl judgments, it looks a lot more unlikely that people would come to know Christ at that point. But... That's all speculation. All right, guys. I hope you're enjoying it. Are you? Okay. All right. You're dismissed. I love you guys.